Hello, thanks for dropping by. In this video I'm going to attempt to repurpose and reuse some electronics. What I have here is the electronic module from a Seiko analog clock. The clock was purchased back in 2014 and worked well until last year in 2022. The problem was that it was stopping intermittently. I tried replacing the batteries but that didn't solve the issue. I opened up the clock module on the back to see if there was any problem with the gears or battery connections. However, I couldn't find any obvious problem. I put it back together and it ran for a few more months, but then it finally stopped completely. Before throwing this clock away, I managed to harvest this piece here. This will serve as the heart of the one second time reference I'm planning to make. You could say that this little electronics module contains three parts. The first is the battery holder. The AA battery would sit here. The whole module runs on only 1.5 volts. The second part is the electronics section itself. Under this blob here, the black blob, we have a chip. There's a small capacitor just over here, and then there's the crystal here. The quartz crystal is the key to accurate time owing to its frequency stability. This crystal has a resonant frequency of 32,768 hertz, which if you divide by two, but divide by two again and so on 15 times, you get to exactly one hertz, which is the period of one second. The chip under the blob contains an oscillator and a frequency divider and presumably a driver section. It's this driver section which drives the coil and the coil is what makes up the third part of the module. The coil is connected to the chip via these two connections here. Normally both of these sit at 1.5 volts, therefore if both connections to the coil are at 1.5 volts. There's no voltage across the coil, so no current flows through it, and no magnetic field is established. During one cycle, one of the pins is taken low, so one is now at zero volts while the other remains at 1.5 volts. This causes current to flow in the coil, setting up a magnetic field. The magnetic flux or field is concentrated in this magnetic circuit here, and a little cog that normally sits here starts to turn. On the next cycle, one second later, the other coil connection goes to zero volts, so the coil is energized in the opposite direction. To clarify, the clock module has two outputs. We'll call them X and Y. These each produce a negative pulse, but they alternate, producing a negative pulse every two seconds. It's this alternating action each second that reverses the current through the coil. So when the current through the coil reverses, the magnetic field reverses, but the magnetic gear continues rotating in the same direction. If we want to use this module as a time reference, we need to combine these alternating pulses somehow to obtain a pulse every second. A simple way to combine these pulses would be to use a circuit like this. Before I explain the detail of the operation, I'd like to point out that we'd use an open collector output for our circuit. The reason for this is that with an open collector output, we can more easily interface this circuit with other circuits that use different supply levels or different logic levels. Because our circuit uses a 1.5 volt battery, it would be difficult to interface this with any other circuit, TTL, CMOS, whatever. The downside of the open collector output is that the external circuit will need to supply a pull-up resistor in order to generate the voltage required to give us our signal. So looking at this circuit, each time an output goes to zero volts, our voltage here will go low and presumably turn off this transistor. So let's imagine both outputs from the module are high. So 1.5 volts here, 1.5 volts here, got 1.5 volts here. This is effectively an open circuit because there's no forward bias voltage to allow current to flow through the diode. So if this section here is basically an open circuit, 
this will be switched on, all the current will flow through this transistor switching this transistor on and our output will go to zero volts. On the other hand, if one of these outputs go to zero during the second pulse, this will pull this point low, switching off the transistor. One problem with this circuit is that the forward bias voltage of the diode is very similar to that of the transistor's forward base emitter voltage. To illustrate this problem, imagine the voltage of one of the module outputs goes to zero volts. Now imagine that the diode has a forward voltage drop of 0.65 volts and the transistor has a forward voltage of 0.64 volts. That means we'd have a voltage difference of 10 millivolts across this resistor. If we have a voltage difference, we have a current flow. And any current flowing into the base of this transistor will cause an amplifier current to flow in the collector emitter circuit. So even though we have a zero volt pulse, our transistor might still be slightly switched on. With this circuit, we're relying too heavily on favorable component tolerances for the circuit to work reliably. This is more like gambling than engineering a robust circuit. So we need to try something else. In this circuit, we've eliminated the diodes and replaced them with transistors. The emitter of each transistor is hooked up to one of the module outputs. We have a resistor here in the base circuits to provide current limiting. And we have another resistor here connected to the collectors. And this provides a voltage divider by which we can switch this transistor on and off. So how does it work? In this case, both module outputs are high at 1.5 volts. That's the condition that they're in between the clock pulses. The emitter voltages are both at 1.5 volts. The base voltage is also at 1.5 volts, which is the rail voltage. Because both the base and the emitter are at the same voltage, there's no current flow. This transistors are switched off. Transistors are switched off. So this whole section here is basically like an open circuit. It's as though there's nothing there. So the current path for the current flowing through this resistor is only through the base of this transistor, switching this transistor on hard, taking our output to logic low or zero volts. Now let's look at the next condition where one of the module outputs is now at zero volts in the middle of one of the second pulses. In this case, for example, output Y has gone to zero volts. So the emitter voltage here is zero volts. So that means if the emitter is at zero volts, the base has to be at 0.6 of a volt, which means this transistor is now switched on. Because this transistor is switched on, the collector voltage has gone to zero volts. So we've eliminated that 0.6 volt diode forward voltage drop. Our base voltage here is at zero volts. So this transistor is switched off hard, which means the output is high. One important consideration with this design is the reverse voltage between the base and emitter pins. In other words, the condition where the voltage on the emitter is higher than the base. This voltage limit is quite low. And so for the transistors I'm using, the 2SC1815s, the maximum allowable voltage is five volts. So to check our design, let's say, as it is in this case, output Y here is zero volts, X is 1.5 volts. To calculate the maximum reverse voltage, we have 1.5 volts here on the emitter. And because this is forward biased, we have 0.6 on this base. So 1.5 volts minus 0.6 volts gives us 0.9 volts. So that's well within the transistor's limit of 5 volts. For durability, I'll add these two components to the open collector output. The resistor will limit the transistor collector current in the event someone accidentally connects it to the supply rail in the interfacing circuit. I'll choose a 100 ohm 1 watt resistor for this, and this will give reasonable protection up to about 10 volts. 
the diode you see there clamps the output transistor collector voltage to minus 0.6 of a volt and that's there just in case someone applies a, a negative voltage to the open collector output. Before we do anything else, let's test our circuit using the outputs from the module. The module connections are shown here. This is our breadboarded prototype circuit. I've used 10K resistors here simply because they're what I had within easy reach. These limit the current flow to a maximum of about 150 microamps. Success! The oscilloscope here shows an output train of pulses with a period of exactly one second. A close-up view shows the pulses have a duration of about 28 milliseconds. To reduce size, I've cut the module to separate the electronics section. I'll keep the coil, it might come in handy someday. The electronics section is soldered to the board, with the module outputs connected by off-cut component leads. So now is the moment of truth. We'll switch it on and watch the oscilloscope. Switched on. Perfect. I've decided to use banana plug sockets as the main connectors. For size reasons, I'll power the circuit with a AAA battery. The power is switched off with an unnecessarily oversized switch. The reason for using this switch was simply that I have a lot of them lying around. I don't expect to do any maintenance on this circuit, so I opted for thick double-sided tape as the board and battery holder mounting solution. Now we've finally assembled the whole unit here. You can see it's a neat little box. We still need to stick a label on here just so everyone knows what it is. So no one tries to stick 240 volts in here. I have a demonstration circuit here. This is a CD4017 CMOS chip, a decade counter. And I've hooked three LEDs up to the first three outputs. The fourth output I've fed back to the reset pin. And we can see here, I've got a pull-up resistor right here that's connecting to our 5 volt rail. And I will connect this, uh, it goes to the, the clock pin here. I'll connect this to our, our one second reference. So we have to connect the ground to ground. The open collector to our clock circuit. We'll see what happens with these LEDs. Let's switch it on and give it a go. And there we go. So each LED switches through once per second. I hope you found this video interesting. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please feel free to leave them below in the comments. Thanks for watching and have a terrific day.